uh, good afternoon, everybody. Now, we said a prayer uh, to start our, our meal, uh, so I won't begin with a prayer right now. I'm going to start with some, start with something else. Adam was hanging around the Garden of Eden, feeling very lonely. So God asked him, what's wrong with you? Adam said he didn't have anyone to talk to. God said that he was going to make Adam a companion and that it would be a woman. He said, this pretty lady will gather food for you. No laughing in the peanut gallery back there. This pretty woman will gather food for you. She will cook for you. And when you discover something, she will wash it for you. She will always agree with every decision you make. And she will not nag you and will always be the first to admit she was wrong when you've had a disagreement. She will praise you. She will bear your children and never ask you to get up in the middle of the night to take care of them. She will never have a headache and will freely love you whenever you need it. Adam asked God, what will a woman like this cost? God replied, an arm and a leg. Then Adam asked, what can I get for a rib? (laughs) Of course, the rest is history. Well, Jack asked me to talk for about 45 minutes. And if you talk to anybody that knows anything about homiletics, you never talk for 45 minutes, Jack. You don't even come close to it, you know, and um, so maybe more like 20 minutes, maybe more like 15, if you don't mind. We'll see. We'll see where the Holy Spirit leads us. What's that? And then take some questions too. Well, um, I guess I guess I could start off. Jack wanted me to talk a little bit about my childhood. You know, I'm I'm not pro-life because I went went to St. Vincent Pilate Catholic High School. Uh, there was some Catholic influence. I'm not Catholic or pro-life because I went to St. Mary's Elementary School. I'm Catholic. I'm pro-life because of my parents. And one of the things we've really lost sight of today is that parents are the first teachers of their children in the ways of faith. How many of you, first of all, I wanted to ask if all of our college students would stand up. And all of our elementary school students would stand up. No, no, stay standing. Come on now. And who else have we got here? Have we got, haven't we got some elementary school young people? Homeschoolers, too. College age, We want to have our college-age folks stand up. Well, why do we have people sitting down? You're not in college? You're not in, oh, high school. Let's have our high school. I knew I was missing something. Would you all join me in showing our gratitude and our thanks to these wonderful young people? Okay, you can sit back down now. Thank you. We need to affirm our young people. Now, how many of you young people are here because your mom or dad said you're going to do this? Raise your hand. Boy, boy, uh, parenting has changed, but maybe for the better. (laughs) There were a few times I did something because my parents said, you are going to do it because I said so. And it was the right thing to do. Well, do you want to hear the parable of the yo-yos? Or do you want to hear how my parents ruined me? Which story do you want to hear? We may not have time. Do you want the parable of the yo-yos? Well, back in the 70s, on the playground at St. Mary's, one day all the kids had yo-yos. They were all playing with their yo-yos, and we didn't have yo-yos. So we went to mom and dad, and they said, well, we want to have yo-yos. Now, parenting was different back then. There was what we call pedagogy. Parents were always cooking up plots, right? So as soon as my mother heard we wanted something, a plot immediately came to mind. So she said, well, if you want yo-yos, then you'll earn the money to buy them. So we worked, and we worked, and we worked. Finally, we got enough money to buy the yo-yos, and we went to buy the yo-yos. And we're out on the playground playing with our yo-yos, and we were the only ones playing with yo-yos. So I learned a couple of things. I learned that fads come and go, and I learned that we were different than all the other kids. And very often, that's what my parents said. When we said, we want to be like this family, we want to be like that family, my parents were very quick to say, we're not like all the other families. We're different. And one of the ways that we knew we were different, I think we were out with the, pro-life, with, uh, the March for Life in D.C. I think the very first year. My mother was a, an ardent pro-lifer in St. Mary. She was right on the cutting edge of the movement. As soon as Roe v. Wade passed, she was very active in pro-life. I would say that was probably her primary apostolate. And we were down there in Washington every winter for the March for Life. And that's one of the reasons I'm pro-life, because of my parents, because of their witness. I guess I can tell you about how my parents ruined me. You want to hear that story too? So I have a, I run this uh, parish, small parish in Southern Maryland. I get confused around places like this where there's a lot, big groups of people, and you have multi-purpose rooms one, two, three, and four. It really is a very small parish, and I and I actually love it very much. But that means I know about my people, and I know my people, and that can that can have positive 
uh, ramifications and it can also have slightly negative things, not for me, for them sometimes, I guess, from their perspective. But anyway, so uh, one year at Easter time, I told my people, I said, well, my parents ruined me and this is how it happened. We grew up uh, in season, my, my pastor at home never saw us at Mass. As soon as the boating season started, until it, we were never at St. Mary's in Laurel. Why was that? Well, we were always out on our boat. That was our family activity. We were sailboaters. And as the family grew, uh, we went from a, a Cape Cod dory to uh, an O'Day to a Venture and then to a Clipper. But my father always, he, as the family grew, eventually I was one of six, we had to, as you can imagine, we had to get a bigger boat. And he always wanted a trailerable boat. So we went on some wonderful vacations. It doubled as a camper. We'd go down to Florida. We'd go up to Canada, the Thousand Islands. So we had a wonderful experience as a family, and I'll always be thankful to my parents for that. But before the internet, before cell phones, I can't remember with all of that time on the bay, sailing and exploring new places and going up to you know, uh, the Canada and down to Florida and then places in between, Maine, um, I don't remember ever missing Mass. This is before 1-800 mass times. This is before the internet. This is before cell phones. And now I'm seeing, I see my families and my parents. So anyway, that's how my parents ruined me because I actually expect people to attend Sunday mass. And it helps my people if I tell them where I'm coming from, you know, and, and I tell them, now I, I've come to believe that some of my parishioners must be independently wealthy because they're taking some long summer vacations. I'm telling you what, but anyway, but we're, we're, you know, we're trying to change our, our, our pedagogy, the way we're doing things in the parish, because we want to help our parents to become better parents. Um, and I was just spending some time the other day reading the book, Forming Intentional Disciples. I, I think we have to, uh, when I first got to the parish, people would, would, uh, would sign up for, 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 uh, faith formation. We called it, uh, we called it religious ed or CCD. And when I first arrived at the parish, we're now calling it faith formation, and we're more intentional about that. But they'd be very quick to sign up their children. They'd be very quick to get the kids to Mass. But sometimes I'd be up at church for Mass, and then I'd go down to the hall, and I'd see some young kids that didn't make it to Mass, but they made it to CCD. So I saw, I saw that things were really going backwards for some of our families. And, and this year, we're, we're, um, we're meeting with both of the parents, and we're going to talk to them about being intentional disciples so that they can hand on their faith to their children. A lot of our, of our families have tried to, to, to act as though the faith is something that's a product that you're buying and that the parents don't really have to buy into it. Um, they can just kind of attempt to get their children through the sacraments and somehow they're going to live their faith. And that's just not so. Um, as, as we know very well, as we grow in our mature, become more mature in our faith, we know that it's a relationship. Um, and it, so Jack wanted me to talk a little bit about how I grew up, how I became pro-life, but I want to do something for our young people today that wasn't done for me. You know, a lot of people like to, uh, like to talk about things they haven't read about, and when you're going to have a meal, whether it's the faith, a natural meal like lunch, or whether it's the faith, you want to have some solid food. So how, I'd like to have a couple of volunteers come on up here. Help me with something. Get something out to everybody. So you don't have to take this home. But we're going to just open these things up here. There's either get a handout or get a little booklet here. Okay, we're just going to go through and look. Just we're going to look at a few things here so that our young people are more intentional about being pro-life. We talked about conception earlier. You know, if a child isn't conceived, um, the child can't be born. And a lot of our our babies are not even making it past conception these days. So we need to focus. And one of the things that they've been doing is asking people to to celebrate their baptism and maybe even celebrate when they were conceived. Just, you know, pick a date nine months before your birthday and think about the the love that brought your parents together so that they could conceive you and and bring you into the world in the first place. So again, if if children aren't conceived, children can't be born. And, And one of the things that the church has not been so quick to talk about is the evil of contraception. But this year, when we were celebrating the 50th, anniversary of Vatican II. Uh, we're celebrating also the 50th anniversary with that of, of a document called Humanae Vitae that Paul VI, probably the most significant thing that Paul VI did in his entire pontificate. And, and we're looking at the possibility of, of I, I guess not just the possibility, but I think they are going to beatify Paul VI uh, this coming fall. And if there's anything that he would be beatified for, it was his courage in going against the tide and in speaking out about really the holiness that God has given in the marital act to a man and a woman, the beautiful gift that a man and a woman alone are able to give to each other within the sacrament of marriage. And again, it's a holy thing. And um, 
So what I wanted to do, we're going to first talk about really the, what the core of Humanae Vitae was about. You know, you guys are part of the pro-life uh, movement, part of the defend life movement, and you're going to want to be able to talk to your peers and talk to others to be able to defend the faith. You have to know the faith. And so you have to be armed with a few, some solid meat. And so, uh, you know, when you want to be able to talk about, well, contraception, why not, or why, um, you need to have something to fall back on, a deeper understanding of the gift that God, give, God gives to a man and a woman. You know, we used to, to, it used to be really simple. Back, we, we, we had this nursery rhyme, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes junior in the baby carriage. Any of our young people heard that one before? Yeah. yeah. Maybe you Googled it. Did you find it on the Internet? Is that how you know about it? <laughs> Sometimes the, the internet uh, has stymied our verbal, our oral tradition a little bit, but it's good to hear if some of that oral tradition is still... Well, little things like that were how people taught young people to think about the relationship between marriage and, and, and children. Um, one of the things that John Paul II was very, very plain about and spoke openly about, you know, every child has a right to be brought into the world by a man and a woman already committed to each other in marriage. A child has a right to that. And when a young man and a, a young woman uh, uh, act in such a way as to leave a child in danger of being conceived and brought into the world without that secure, loving, supportive relationship, that home that God says, every child needs that security of a mom and a dad who, who have already said to each other, I'm going to be here, I'm not going anywhere, I'm committed, who understand what true love is. You know, a woman who puts a guy's feet to the, to the fire and says, this is what love means. You know that song, that put a ring on it? <laughs> you know? Put a ring on it if you love me. So young women with the courage to say to a young man that, that they do love very much, but that they're honest with. Today I was talking, sometimes I put things on Twitter. I'm praying for spouses that have such a strong and secure love for each other that they're willing to even preach the gospel to each other. They're so strong and secure in their love in Christ. And I see that in the parish, where a mother's attending Mass with her sons, but the father never comes. Father, I have to work. And I called this guy and I said, do you take time off from work to go to school, scouts, or sports? And he said, yes. And I said, well, you are, sir, you are MIA. You are missing in action. They tell the priest, they say, Father, I have have to work. I'm going skiing. I have to do this. I have to do that. It's not about Father. I'm not going to be there on Judgment Day. It's going to be you and the Lord, so you need to talk to Him about that. If you think working, and it's, it's your children that suffer because your children see that you're working instead of going to Mass, but then you're taking time off from work for things that we know are less important than your relationship with God. So pr- please pray for my families. We're going to meet with our both parents, whether they're Catholic or not, before they can register their children for faith formation. We're going to ask parents who are not Catholic to please be one with the family and support the family. Every person needs time apart from God, and every human person needs to keep the Lord's Day holy, whether they're Catholic or not. So we're going to be asking our non-Catholic parents to please come and be with the family and support the family. You know, if Junior, if Juniorette likes the circus, but Junior doesn't, sometimes Mom and Dad go to Juniorette, Junior and say, you know, we know you don't really like the circus, but you love your sister. So we're all going to go as a, fa- a t- family together to the circus, and you're going to enjoy it, you know. Families do that all the time. They do that all the time, because they understand the importance of doing things as a family. How much more important is it to come before the Lord? And there really is a crisis of faith, because if people understood they're really coming together before the Lord in the midst of his people, that this is Christ's church, that we do experience his presence in word and sacrament, if people had that strong faith, they might do that, be able to do that with less coaching and with less prodding, you know. But I thank, I thank God for my parents because they taught me how to be a parent, how to be a father, you know. And, and I tell my people, we don't have altar girls like all the parishes around us. We don't do what all the other parishes do. I'm forming my people by using venerable Catholic customs like having young men serve with the priest because their masculinity, like the priest's masculinity, is a sign of the Jesus Christ, the priest who offers, is offered, and received on the altar. So I believe in our, in our venerable Catholic customs, because I want to hand on the faith. Now, I compromise in other areas. I'm asking fathers and daughters to form teams for lecturing. So I'm willing to, to make compromises. I realize that the Catholic world is sort of a polyglot existence right now. You go from one parish to the next, and you really don't even know you're in the same church sometimes. And that's just the reality that the bishop 
bishops have presented us with to work with. Now bishops are trying to, uh, the bishops have realized that, that some mistakes have been made, like standing for communion. I really don't believe, I mean, if you look at the masses, I'm, I'm going around the globe before I get back to my point, but so um, it's the tour with Father Cusick homily style, you know, <laughs> around the globe. And But anyway, so if you think about the mass, I mean, it's it's intellectually it's it's intellectually dissonant because you're you're kneeling during the mass when Christ becomes present, but then at that most important meeting at Christ at mass, the reason why he becomes present, we're standing, and some people aren't even barely you know nodding their head. Well, that's we know that's not. We just knelt when he became present, and now we're standing when we consummate, the moment is consummated, the the reason why he's here to marry his people to espouse himself to the church and barely, you know, just a a nod of the head. So I try to train my people and, but what we did a couple years ago or very soon after I arrived, we we have an altar rail. So our people, all your pastor has to do is invite the people to receive communion side by side. And then he can start to offer a place for them to kneel like a, a cushion or something like that. It's very easy to reintroduce Uh, kneeling for communion. It's very easy to make it happen. Be there to support your pastor. Be there, join the parish council, go to Father, have a meeting with him, suggest that he probably won't get uh, a road at, ridden out of town on a rail or tarred and feathered if he tries to do this. He, his, he might survive. Yeah, I know. Yeah, my, my, car, my archbishop sort of leaves me alone. So, but anyway, so far, so far, pray. So, but anyway, uh, if you would turn to uh, on page 15, if you have the book, page 15, if you have the, uh, if you have the handout, you will see the page numbers on the bottom. Page 15, uh, number 12. It's very simple. The scriptures teach what God has joined, man must not divide. And in the one marital act, it's very easy by the light of natural reason to see that in the one marital act, that very special embrace that's given to man and a woman alone in marriage and made holy because they've been joined in Christ, uh, God has joined both what we call the procreative and the unitive. What does that mean? That a man and a woman have the potential to create another human being with God, and they also are, un- are unified. They, they consummate their union as one flesh, just as the scripture promises the man and the woman in marriage. And we want our young people to understand this gift so that they're prepared to share it in a holy way when they enter the vocation of marriage. And so, you know, it's good to talk about this. It's good to quote the scriptures. It's good to... to so. But flowing from that reality, because God has put those two together... Husband and wife should never do anything of their own volition intentionally to separate those two. And one of the, one of the primary purposes of, of this document, Humanae Vitae, was Paul VI wanted to just come right out and say clearly that every use of artificial contraception is a moral evil. And why is that? Because every time it's used, it's done with an anti-life will. It's not possible to use artificial contraception without doing it with an anti-life will. And when we're anti-life, hey, why are you out here today? Why are you out here on the, on the, on the um, Face the Truth tour? I better not forget the name of it. I'll get in trouble with Jack. Why are you out here? Because you can't love God unless you love life. And if you want to be like God, then you must love life as God does. Think about that. Think about loving life the way God loves life. This is radical. This is a radical Christian calling that you young people have a beautiful, blessed opportunity to confront at such an early stage in your life. To love God as, uh, to love life as God loves it. Now that's being holy. That's being a saint. To love life as God loves it. Every human person now, St. Francis went a little crazy. He even loved the birds and talked to them. So he was like a super saint. He's a super saint. We can do that too. But above every other thing that God has made, we must love hum- the human person so much that we even love the child coming into being. The child that isn't even conceived yet. We love even that child. And in the hopes and dreams of a husband and wife, they never do anything of their own will intentionally to frustrate God's beautiful plan for that child coming into being. And so Paul VI uses some kind of fancy academic language. He says that use of artificial contraception is excluded, 
It's kind of fancy language. He says the use of artificial contraception for the reasons that he lays out here because of the holiness of the marital act and because God has placed both the unit and the procreative aspects in this one marital act for a husband and wife to act in any way against life, uh, that, that is excluded for them. If they want to be holy as God is holy and they want to love life the way God loves life. So, this is what we call chaste marriage. Did you know how many people know what the word chastity means? How many of our young people ever heard the word chastity? Now, I'm going to ask you a really hard question. Your parents are on trial here. How many of you have heard your parents use the word chastity? Not bad, but we can improve. Not bad. That's good. You have good parents. If they use... I had a confirmation... uh, I had a confirmation interview one time, mom with these three beautiful daughters, and, uh, and I said, now, I'd like to talk about chastity. And the mother said, well, we don't use that word. And I said, well, what word do you use? And she kind of just looked at me. You know, chastity is a beautiful word. Chastity is not a dirty word. And chastity is beautiful because it applies to the vocation of every one of us. There's a chastity proper to the priesthood. There's a chastity proper to marriage. And there's a chastity proper to the single life, a young man or woman who is discerning their vocation, whether to the priesthood, the religious life, or marriage. Chastity is for everyone. It's not just for some. So we all need to talk about chastity, and our parents need to use the word chastity. That is the the church-blessed word that describes the life of every one of us if we're living the Gospels, if we love life as God loves life. So, um, Paul VI talks about chaste intimacy in marriage, the means by which human life is, is transmitted. This is good and honorable. And also people will say, well, Father, what about a couple that can't have children? Every couple is called to be open to life. Every couple is called to share the marital act in a way that's open to life. That in itself is a blessing enough. Whether or not they're able to conceive a child, they're called to love each other just as any married couple does. And God will bless them in that. Some couples are called to adoption. But it says they do not cease to be legitimate, this, the, these, this blessing of, of marriage in the marital embrace. If it does not cease to be legitimate, if it causes independent of the will of husband and wife, they are foreseen to be infertile. Okay, infertility is a great uh, uh, sadness. As a Navy chaplain one time, I sat with a woman and the sobs that she was, the sobs were coming from deep within her being as she cried uh, about her, her inability to conceive a child. And I sat with her and I sorrowed with her. And it's, it's something that is a very great cross. We pray for all of our young people that, that God will bless them with children. Now, within the context of marriage and within the context of being open to life, every time a husband and wife embrace in a special way within marriage, there's something called responsible parenthood. Every family is different. I was one of six, and for me that was the greatest blessing that I could have ever had. Some, some of our friends were one of 14 or 11. Some were one of four or five. Every family is different. Every family is called to be pro-life and open to life, but every family is different. Compare, have you ever heard the saying, comparisons are odious? Some people are blessed with 14, some are blessed with two. We don't compare. We, we, we pray for every couple to be open to life and to be open in a generous way as God calls them. So within responsible parenthood, there can be a, there can be a situation where, where for grave reasons, grave reasons, because being custodians of life is a grave responsibility that God and a privilege and, and a holy thing that God gives to, to a husband and wife, Only for grave reasons are they to space or even delay the birth of another child for an indefinite period of time in the marriage as long as that grave reason uh, persists. And so we have something called natural family planning. Now, natural family planning is the most effective method. Isn't that amazing? That the, The method that God gives a couple to space or delay births for a serious reason is the most effective method. It's amazing. Which, and, and there are some couples which, unfortunately, use natural family planning in an anti-life way. Okay? What we're talking about today is using natural family planning in a holy way. 
Um, and I'm not a doctor, you know, I'm not an MD, but if you talk to parents and you talk to doctors, there are situations where uh, a woman has, received, has, has, been, has had two diagnoses from doctors who tell her that she could endanger her life, you know, and that, this is a, a decision that husbands and wives must make with counsel, with prayer, with utmost seriousness as to whether they're going to space or delay births. But I, the point I wanted to make with natural family planning is, or with, with responsible parenthood is, the church understands that be, to be custodians of life for husband and wife falls within this concern to be responsible parents. Okay, We always generously and lovingly accept every child that comes into the world. We don't use responsible parenthood as an excuse to be anti-life. That's not what we do. We always, without any, uh, you know, without any hesitation, all of us are called to be open to every child that's brought into the world. But at the same time, you know, we, we understand the context of responsible parenthood. And I, I didn't want to go into that too much, but I just wanted to make the point. Uh, some, and, and, and that will come in sometimes when you're having a discussion with somebody and they'll say something like, well, does the church expect every couple to have absolutely every physical number of children they can possibly have? Well, no, the church doesn't do that. And, and God has placed, has given woman and, and man together. Uh, some of the most wonderful experiences I had with young Marines when I was at Camp Lejeune, I started feeding them information about natural family planning. And this young couple, I think it turned out later, tragically, they weren't able to have children. But one day this young Marine sergeant comes, Father, I'd like to find out about that natural family planning. Yeah. Marine. we got a former Marine over here. Marines are my calling within a calling. I have a special love for Marines because I've been able to go to Iraq with them and, and serve with them in North Carolina and other places. So this Marine comes, you know, Father, I want to know about that. I'm ready to hear about that natural family planning, you know. <laughs> well, when he learned about it, you know, he, he, had a, he was a man on a mission. He jumped out of bed in the morning and he went and took the thermometer and gave it to his wife and they did the charts and all that. You probably don't need to do too much about all that right now, but... <laughs> but it brought, but see, the other thing is, and, and you, it, it takes time to learn more about this, but what it does is it makes the man more intimately familiar with his wife. It, it helps the man to, be, to fall more deeply in love with his wife. It opens them to a deeper intimacy in their relationship. Because the husband is, is, is you know... You, get, you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. I guess I don't need to go into more detail. But, you know, uh, <laughs> how many married couples in here don't need any help becoming, falling more in love with each other? How many don't need help? How many are where you need to be right now? No. That's the wonderful thing. That we, were you going to raise hands, anybody? Anybody exactly where they want to be in their marriage? No. And that's wonderful. That means that every marriage is called to, be, to become a deeper love, a deeper giving, a deeper experience of the cross and resurrection. The whole life of your marriage. And, and, and in the church, we have, we have ministries that help couples to rediscover the beauty of their marriage. We, we, we must continue to pray for our couples and pray for our families. There's uh, wonderful things like um, 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 Marriage Encounter and Retro Bay and all, all kinds of beautiful ministries to help couples and help families. So I, I just wanted to give you some meat today. You know what? Uh, how many of you knew about Humana Vitae before today? So I, I accomplished something. Good for you guys. All right. I couldn't believe it one time. The internet does have good aspects to it. I, I ran into some young guy. I can't remember whether he was military or whatever. And I said, how did you know about Humane Vitae? He said, I looked it up on the internet. You know, I read it. You know, and, which means we're, I think we're more responsible than ever. People think, well, if I don't know, I'm off the hook. That doesn't mean you're off the hook. All of us have a responsibility to know the truth. And if we don't make the effort to know the truth, we're responsible for not making the effort. God believes in us, and he gives us great responsibility, and, and he loves us very much. So, any questions? <laughs> I answered all your questions.